Stepping up to the couch, it's Brian, who led the league last season in cracked screens. But with his new athletic case, it looks like that won't be the case. <laughs> Touchdown, Brian! When Kobe and Duncan were both in their primes, a new name came into the mix in between that period. That name was LeBron James. As a freshman at St. Vincent St. Mary, LeBron averaged 21 points and 6 rebounds. As a 14-year-old, the Fighting Irish would go 27-0 and win a state title. In his sophomore season, he would average 25-7-6. And, and LeBron became such a national sensation that St. Vincent St. Mary had to play home games at the University of Akron to fit the ticket demand. LeBron would be named Ohio's Mr. Basketball. The Irish would go 26-1 and, and repeat as state champions. As a junior, the story of the greatest high school player ever spread even more. He would appear in Slam Magazine, be on the cover of Sports Illustrated, he'd average 29 points, 8 rebounds, and 6 assists. He was named Ohio Mr. Basketball for the second year in a row, be USA Today's All-USA First Team, and he would be the first junior to ever be named Gatorade's National Player of the Year. Despite his individual success, the Irish would lose four games this season and lose the Division II Championship. Because of his legend spreading in his senior year, LeBron and the Fighting Irish would travel around the country to play national nationally ranked teams. James averaged 31.6 points, 9.6 rebounds, and 4.6 assists for the third straight year he was named Ohio Mr. Basketball, and the Irish would win their third division title in four years. And LeBron would then declare for the NBA draft, where in a storybook fashion, he would be drafted by the Cleveland Cavaliers, and LeBron became the hometown hero. This would be both a blessing and the worst thing that could ever happen to LeBron. His first stint in Cleveland would be a non-stop carry job for James. In his rookie year, LeBron defended the hype that he received in high school. Many players collapse into mediocrity with less hype. LeBron more than rose up to the challenge. Though he certainly had some issues as a rookie, he was fairly inefficient and averaged too many turnovers, but the good of his rookie year far outweighed that bad. He averaged 20.9 points, 5.5 rebounds, and 5.9 assists on 41.7% field goal percentage. The Cavs would miss the playoffs, and he would not be named an All-Star, but he would win Rookie of the Year over Carmelo 
Carmelo Anthony. In his second season, LeBron would blossom even more and be named an All-Star, but in his third season, LeBron put up a career-high 31.4 points per game, along with 7 rebounds and 6.6 .6 assists. LeBron came second in MVP voting behind Steve Nash. The Cavaliers would make it to the playoffs for the first time since 98, but they would lose to the Detroit Pistons in the second round. Next season, the Cavs would win 50 games, be the second seed in the East, face the Pistons in the conference finals, and in an unbelievable performance, LeBron would put up 48-9-7 and in Game 5. He scored 29 out of 30 of Cleveland's last points and hit the game-winning layup. Five seconds, four, three, James scores with 2.2 to go. The Cavaliers lead 109-107 and the Pistons call for time. 48 points for LeBron James. He has scored the last 25 points for Cleveland. 29 of the last 30. In his fourth season in the league, with little to no help on his team, LeBron had made it to the NBA Finals. But facing the juggernaut San Antonio Spurs, led by Tim Duncan, the Cavs had a zero chance, and they would lose in a sweep. This playoff run LeBron went on would basically sum up the entirety of his time on the Cavaliers. Individual success that unfortunately led to losing in the playoffs, because of the lack of talent alongside him. He didn't get the advantage of being drafted onto a team with Kareem or Shaq, or ending up with a guy like Scottie Pippen. Pippen or Tony Parker and Ginobili, LeBron never got another guy alongside him in his first stint in Cleveland, and the addition of the big three Boston Celtics and the Dwight Howard Orlando Magic didn't exactly help. So from 2007 to 2010, LeBron dominated winning two MVP awards in 2009 and 2010, but again due to a lack of help, the Cavs didn't win much, and in the second round of the 2010 playoffs versus the Boston Celtics, LeBron essentially gave up on the team when he realized that he he, once again, was in an uphill battle, where despite his amazing play, he would inevitably lose. LeBron would go live on TV and announce the next chapter of his career. The answer to the question everybody wants to know. LeBron, what's your decision? Um, in this fall, man, this is, this is very tough. Um, in this fall, I'm going to take my talents to South Beach and um, join the Miami Heat. LeBron was joining Dwayne Wade and Chris Bosh in Miami to force the Miami Big Three, but before he would even get onto the court, he immediately shot himself in the foot by being a part of this party where they celebrated like they already won. And in this party, he said this. To win championships, not one, championships. Not two. LeBron, tell us about that. Not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven. The Big Three era in Miami would get off to a rough start. LeBron, Wade, and Bosh struggled to fit together initially. LeBron also struggled mightily with the criticism that came his way for his decision because the move he made at the time was unprecedented. LeBron would decide to embrace this villain role the NBA fan base had assigned him, and the Miami Heat would be the second seed in the East behind the Derrick Rose Bulls. The Heat would beat those Bulls with LeBron effectively shutting down Rose, and they would head to the NBA Finals to face the underdog. Dallas Mavericks who were led by Dirk Nowitzki. This series would be the biggest stain on LeBron's legacy and his case for GOAT. LeBron averaged a measly 17.8 points, 7.2 rebounds, 6.8 assists, and 4 turnovers on 47% shooting. Not a terrible stat line for an average player, but for a superstar who most would have considered the best player in the league, it was pitiful. LeBron was even outscored by Jason Terry, the sixth man on the Mavericks who averaged 8 18 points on 49.4% field goal percentage. Not only did LeBron get outscored by Terry, but after shutting down Derrick Rose, somehow he was the reason many times for Terry scoring, consistently getting burned by a six man. To make matters worse, LeBron would put up 8 points on 27% shooting in Game 4, where the Heat could have gone up 3-1. The series would be the lowest point in LeBron's career. All the criticism of him being unable to win in Cleveland only got worse when he was unable to win with two All-Star teammates versus a team with only one All-Star. LeBron would head into the 2011-12 season with only one goal, prove them all wrong. The first step was no longer trying to be the villain. LeBron was so focused on being the the bad guy that he was no longer being himself. He regained his sense of joy playing like he used to. He would win his third MVP with averages of 27.1 points, 7.9 rebounds, 6.2 assists, and 1.9 steals on 53% shooting. In the second round versus the Pacers,
because Chris Bosh went down with an abdominal injury, which made it challenging for the top-heavy Heat to beat the aging Boston Celtics. In Game 5, Paul Pierce would hit a game-winning three in LeBron's eyes to go up 2-2. Pierce for three. It's good. Paul Pierce from way downtown. And Boston leads by four. Once again, LeBron found himself in a situation where he was going to lose to an underdog team. But this time, LeBron responded. In Game 6, he put up 45 points, 15 rebounds, and 5 assists on 73.1% shooting. The Heat would finish off the series in Game 7 and head to the finals to face the young OKC Thunder. The Heat would win in 5 games, LeBron would win his first championship, he'd win Finals MVP on 28.6 points, 10.3 rebounds, and 7.4 assists on 47% shooting. Shooting, he would finally achieve his goal of being a champion. LeBron would only capitalize on this in the 2012-13 season. This is the season that most would agree was LeBron's best. He would average 26.8 points, 8 rebounds, 7.3 assists, 1.7 steals, nearly a block, a career-high 40% from 3, and his second best career field goal percentage of 56.5%. He'd win his fourth MVP, lead his team to the finals to face the San Antonio Spurs. Going into Game 6, the Spurs were up 3-2. Going into the fourth quarter, the Heat were down 10, and it was looking like the Spurs would be walking away with the championship. But LeBron would once again respond with 16 points in the fourth quarter on 70% shooting as well as two assists, but it would be Ray Allen who saved the game with a step back to the three-point line off of the Chris Bosh offensive rebound that came from LeBron's miss. James catches, puts up the three, will go, rebound Bosh, back out to Allen, his three-pointer, bang! In overtime, LeBron would make sure that the Heat would finish it out with 2 points and 2 assists, which doesn't sound like much, but only 8 points in total were scored by the Heat in overtime, so that was 6 out of 8 points. In Game 7, LeBron would drop 27-12-4, winning the series for the Heat and winning Finals MVP. Next season, the Heat would struggle with injuries, the Heat would lose to the Spurs in the Finals, and LeBron made his second decision. This time, returning to Cleveland to team up with Kyrie Irving and Kevin Love after the Cavs traded Andrew Wiggins for him. Just like Miami, the Cavs struggled at first, but after trading for some role players and getting their chemistry figured out, the Cavaliers established themselves as the best team in the East. Even though the Atlanta Hawks had a better record, most would have agreed that the Cavs were going to the finals, and the Cavs proved that by beating them in the conference finals on a sweep. They would face the Warriors in the finals, but unfortunately, they had no Kevin Love thanks to Kelly Olenek dislocating his shoulder, and Kyrie Irving went back down with an injury that previously bothered him in the second round versus the Bulls. So LeBron was essentially by himself versus the Warriors with Timothy Mozgov being the second best player for the Cavs. LeBron put up 35-13-9, but because of all the defensive pressure that was on him, he only shot 39.8% from the field. The Warriors won in six games, but next year LeBron would get a chance at revenge. Kyrie and Kevin Love were completely healthy for the series, but this wasn't the same Warriors team. The Dubs went 73-9, breaking the record for wins in a season. Stephen Curry was the first unanimous MVP in NBA history, and Klay Thompson and Draymond Green with an another season as star players and proved immensely. This was a juggernaut of a team, but the Cavs were healthy and there would be no more excuses for losing. The series would not start out in Cleveland's favor, the Warriors would infamously go up 3-1. It looked like LeBron would once again lose in the finals and have a record of 2-5 in the finals. Not a great look, but in Game 4, LeBron and Kyrie Irving both put up 41 points. LeBron also had 16 rebounds and 7 assists to go along with it, and they beat the Warriors 112-97. Game 6, the Warriors once again failed to close out the Cavaliers. LeBron once again dropped 41 with 8 rebounds and 11 assists on 59% shooting. The Cavs beat the Warriors by 14. After this game, the thought of a comeback was there. No team had ever blown a 3-1 lead in the finals, just like no team had won 73 games or had a unanimous MVP. Heading into Game 7, there was no pressure on the Cavs and LeBron. Though losing another finals would have been bad for his legacy, forcing a Game 7 after going down 3-1 was accomplishment enough to get by. But all of the pressure was on Golden State. Pressure not to choke. This was the lowest scoring game combined between the two teams. LeBron had an off shooting night, shooting just 37.5%. The Cavs just barely shot over 40%, and the Warriors shot 38%. James had a 27 point triple double with 11 rebounds and 11 assists. With 4.5 minutes left, both teams went on a massive scoring drive. The game was tied at 89 for three and a half minutes. The Warriors finally got an opportunity to score off of a Kyrie miss. They got out on the fast break, Curry passed it to Andre Iguodala, and well, you know what happened.
Two possessions later, the ball was in Kyrie Irving's hands and he hit the game deciding three over the unanimous MVP. Irving and Curry, one on one. Irving puts it up. It's good! Kyrie Irving from downtown! And the Cavaliers by three! Curry brought the ball up, tried to tie the game over Kevin Love, he missed. LeBron hit the free throw to seal the game, and Cleveland had successfully came back from being down 3-1. This would be the most impressive accomplishment of LeBron's career, and it would be the high point of his career. Not only did he win in one of the greatest final series of all time, but he also finally fulfilled his promise to bring a championship to Cleveland. And of course, he would be the finals MVP with averages of 29 points, 7 points, 11.3 rebounds, 8.9 assists, 2.6 deals on 2.3 blocks, on 49.4% field goal percentage, and 37% from three. Unfortunately, after this, the Warriors would sign Kevin Durant, the player many considered to be the second best player in the league behind LeBron. With Curry, Clay, Green, and Durant, there was no chance at winning. For the next two seasons, the Cavs would lose in the finals in 2017. Kyrie would demand a trade and head to the Celtics. LeBron would carry a piss-poor roster to the finals and lose in four games. And most recently, he signed with the Lakers and is now looking to build something in LA to hopefully add to his astounding resume. Today for show and tell, I brought my uncle LeBron, who was NBA Rookie of the Year. Did you win the championship? No. Yeah, but you made the playoffs. I just missed them. Let's look at the froggy again. <laughs> LeBron's dominance and stranglehold on the NBA from 2010 to 2018 cannot be overstated. This decade of basketball excellence has not been done on that level before. Bill Russell's Celtics made the finals many times in a row, but Bill was on the same team with the same level of help, with the same coach and same everything. LeBron went back and forth between many different situations plenty of times, having an undeniable super star with Dwayne Wade in 2011 and 12, but Chris Bosh, who struggled to fit in, and 2013 and 14, Wade was on the decline, but Chris Bosh now had a defined role. In Cleveland, he had to adjust to a new environment and a new team, and in 2018, he had to carry a garbage team to the finals. But as soon as he went to the Lakers, he missed out on the playoffs, which feeds into the other side, which says that the weakness of the Eastern Conference is the reason why LeBron made it to the finals so many times. Times. However, the opposition would say, look at the Eastern Conference in 2019. As soon as LeBron is gone, suddenly the East is great. So it could be argued that he is the reason that the East looks so great. The East didn't look particularly strong under Jordan either. LeBron has won three championships over his career, four MVPs, three finals MVPs. He earned All-NBA First Team honors 12 times, second team twice, was All-Defensive First Team five times, second team once, Rookie of the Year, and he he is a 15-time All-Star winning MVP three times. But what's important to acknowledge is that LeBron is the only candidate who has yet to retire from the NBA. He's still active, so like we did with MJ's retirement numbers and Russell and Wilt's block numbers, we will do some conservative speculation. We're going to assume that LeBron plays until the age of 38. Many think he could play till 40, which is probably true, but we're being conservative here. That's four more seasons, we'll assume he averaged 70 games a season, averaging 24 points, 7 rebounds, 6.5 assists, 1.3 steals, and 0.7 blocks for those four seasons. That leads to a total of 39,061 points, which would place him first all time, though it's less points than Jordan's hypothetical. LeBron is likely to achieve this mark, whereas Jordan is just a hypothetical, unless he wants to come out of retirement again at the age of 60. It would give him 10,416 assists, which places him third all time, though it would be fourth with Magic's hypothetical numbers, it would give him 10,790 rebounds, 32nd all-time, 2,126 blocks, which is 17th all-time, 2,294 steals, which places him at 7th all-time. So LeBron is on pace to be 1st in scoring, 3rd in assists, 32nd all-time in rebounds, 14th in blocks, and 7th in steals. His name will be all over the all-time lists. We will also give LeBron 4 more All-NBA second-team selections 
seasons as well as all-star appearances, his statistical impact and versatility is unquestionable. Lethal scorer, amazing passer, great rebounder, a good to great versatile defender up until the last three seasons, LeBron is to most the most versatile player of all time. No player is as good at every aspect of the game as LeBron. However, his record in the finals as well as the 2011 finals is a pretty big stain on his career, but some would argue that 2007, 2017, and 2018 are excusable. Beating the Spurs in 2007 was next to impossible. Beating KD, Steph, Clay, and Green in 2017 with Kyrie Irving was pretty damn unlikely, so beating them in 2018 without Kyrie, pretty much impossible. So LeBron has the statistical dominance, but his dominance in the East is at the very least questionable and his finals record is pretty bad. So with every single candidate's case now laid out, looking at each player at an individual level, let's now look at them in comparison to each other. Now when you're comparing 9 players it can get pretty messy, so it will need to be organized into categories. Accomplishments and career numbers, and we will be ranking their level of help. Starting with accomplishments, 4 championships, Bill Russell ranks 1st with 13, Jordan and Kareem are tied for 2nd with 6, Kobe Duncan and Magic are tied for third with five, LeBron James and Larry Bird are fourth with three, and Wilt Chamberlain comes in fifth with two championships. For MVPs, Kareem comes in with an NBA record six MVPs, Jordan and Russell both have five, which is second, LeBron and Wilt are third with four MVPs, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson both have three, Tim Duncan has two for fifth place, and Kobe comes in last with just one MVP. Jordan has an NBA record six for finals MVPs, but we will give Russell the first spot with 7 finals MVPs because the award didn't exist in Russell's time, and it's fair to assume that he would have won at least 7 out of 11 potential final MVPs. So Russell is first with 7, Jordan has 6, Duncan, Magic, and LeBron all have 3, and there's a 3-way tie for 3rd, so Kobe, Bird, and Kareem have 2. For Defensive Player of the Year, we speculated that Russell would win 4, and Wilt would win 2. So Russell ranks first with four, Wilt ranks second with two, and Jordan ranks third with one. Everybody else never won a Defensive Player of the Year award. Here are their All-Star games in comparison, their All-NBA team selections, and All-Defensive team selections. Statistically, Kareem has the most points, but LeBron will more than likely pass him, so we will give him number one with an asterisk, and Kareem two. Next is Kobe at three, Jordan at four, next is Will Chamberlain, Tim Duncan, then Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, and then finally Bill Russell. For rebounds, Wilt and Russell are the top dogs, both with over 20,000 rebounds. Kareem is third, Duncan comes in sixth, then Larry Bird, however, LeBron will pass him, so he is at five, and Bird at six. Kobe at seven, Jordan at eight, though he would have been higher had he not retired, and Magic comes in nine, but same thing, if he wasn't forced to retire, he would be a lot higher here. For assists, first is Magic by a decent margin, adjusted numbers or no, but LeBron would be past his real number, but not his no retirement number. So LeBron would be first, then Magic, then a good bit down the list is Kobe Bryant at 3, Larry Bird at 4, Kareem is actually 5th, MJ at 6, then Wilt, Duncan, and Bill Russell. For career averages, we will break down career averages and prime averages. Jordan and Wilt are tied for career points per game, then we have LeBron, Kobe, Kareem, Larry Bird, Magic, Duncan, and Bill Russell comes in last with just 15 points per game. For prime points per game, Wilt Chamberlain comes in first with an absurd 36 points per game, Jordan in second with 32 points per game, Kobe and Kareem are tied for third with 28.1, then comes LeBron, Bird, Duncan, Magic, and Russell. Wilt is first in career rebounds per game, then Bill Russell, then Kareem, then Duncan, Bird, LeBron, Magic, Jordan, and Kobe. For prime rebounds, the list is in the same order. Wilt is first, averaging just one more rebound than Russell, who is second, then Kareem with 14 a game, then Tim Duncan with nearly 12 a game, Larry Bird in the double digits, then LeBron, Magic, Jordan, and Kobe. For career assists, Magic Johnson is first, then LeBron, Bird, 
Jordan, Kobe, Wilt, Bill Russell, Kareem, and Tim Duncan. And here are prime assists per game. And finally, here is career efficiency using true shooting percentage. Now we will rank the level of help that each player had. The rankings will be fairly simple. Hall of Famers will be 5 points worth of help. All-Stars are 3 points and good but not quite all-star level players and role players will be worth 1 point. An example of a player like that would be Charles Oakley with MJ. Also, some guys were all-stars or even Hall of Famers but were out of their prime when they were on the candidates team or they were only there for a few years, like George Gervin was for MJ. Some will require context. A good player could be a guy that plays his role as, let's just say, an 8-10 to 10 point and 8-10 to 10 rebound player, or as a great defender, a really good shooter, a good scorer who wasn't quite a star. Also, 10 points for a bona fide superstar, like they were top 5 in the NBA at the time that they were teammates with a candidate. And there is also a 1.5 multiplier for players who spent their career on one team, because when a player is on the same team, they usually don't play with as many stars, but they just play with one or two for their careers, like Magic for example. And future Hall of Famers will be accounted for as well. So starting with Bill Russell, he played with nine Hall of Famers, Bob Cousy, Bill Sharman, Tom Heinsohn, Frank Ramsey, Sam Jones, Casey Jones, Tom Sanders, John Havlicek, and Don Nelson. That is a total of 45 Hall of Famer points. Points. Bailey Howell is a Hall of Famer, but that is because of his time in Detroit before becoming a Celtic. He was a one-time All-Star for the Celtics, so he fits into the Justin All-Star category, and he's really the only normal All-Star, so that's three more points. For good non-All-Star players, Russell played with Wally Nalls, who was a former All-Star but just a top-tier role player for the Celtics, and Larry Siegfried, so that's two more points. So Bill Russell has 75 points worth of help after the one 0.5 multiplier. Next is Wilt Chamberlain. For Hall of Famers, Tom Gala, Guy Rogers, Paul Arzen, Nate Thurmond, Hal Greer, Chet Walker, Jerry West, and Elgin Baylor, which is 40 Hall of Fame points. For All-Stars, Woody Salisbury, Tom Messery, Luke Jackson, and Larry Costello. For good not quite All-Star players, Al Adels, Willie Nalls, Wayne Hightower, Paul Newman, Red Kerr, Wally Jones, Mel Counts, Happy Harrison, Flynn Robinson, and Jim McMillan. So that is 62 help points for Wilt. Next is Kareem, who played with a superstar in Magic Johnson, which is 10 points. For Hall of Famers, we have Oscar Robertson, Jamal Wilkes, and James Worthy. For All-Stars, we have Flynn Robinson, Bob Dandridge, Jim Price, and Norm Nixon. For good players, we have John McLaughlin, Greg Smith, Lucius Allen, Curtis Pelly, George Thompson, Cornwell Walker, Gail Goodrich, who is out of his prime, Casey Russell, Kermit Washington, Adrian Dantley, who is a Hall of Famer but wasn't even an all-star on LA, Lou Hudson, who played in LA for his last two seasons, Michael Cooper, Jim Jones, a way out of prime Spencer Haywood, Bob McAdoo, Byron Scott, AC Green, Michael Thompson, and Orlando Woolridge. That is a total of 56 help points. For Magic, he obviously had Kareem, which is 10 points, James Worthy as a Hall of Famer as well as Jamal Wilkes, Norm Nixon is the only all-star, for good players, Jim Jones, Spencer Haywood, Bob McAdoo, Byron Scott, A.C. Green, Michael Thompson, Orlando Woolridge, Michael Cooper, Sam Perkins, and Vladi Divac. That's a total of 44 points. Larry Bird played with three Hall of Famers, Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, and Dennis Johnson. That's 15 points. Tiny Archibald was a Hall of Famer, but only a 12-7 and seven point guard on the Celtics, but he was an All-Star three times. One year of Dave Cowens, who is a Hall of Famer, but he was out of his prime, and it was just one year, so just an All-Star. Danny Ainge was a one-time All-Star, Star and Reggie Lewis was a one-time All-Star in Bird's last year, rest in peace. Cedric Maxwell averaged 15 and 7, but was never an All-Star. Bill Walton was out of his prime for the Celtics, but still a great six-man. Jim Paxson in the last few years of his career. Ed Pickney, Kevin Gamble was a 14-point-per-game scorer for Bird's last two seasons. Brian Shaw was a 14-point-per-game scorer for one season in Boston, and John Bagley averaged 7 and 7 in Bird's last season. That's 57 help points. From Michael Jordan. For Hall of Famers, he played with Scottie Pippen and Dennis Rodman. And he never played with a guy who was just an all-star. Orlando Woolridge and Quentin Daly were both 16 to 17 point scorers in the first few years of Jordan's career. Steve Johnson, Dave Corzin, George Iceman Gervin averaged 
points per game in the final year of his career playing with rookie MJ. Sidney Green was a 13 and 8 power forward, Charles Oakley was a double double enforcer, John Paxson, Sam Vincent, Bill Cartwright was a solid center, Horace Grant was a one time all star but only in the season where MJ was retired, BJ Armstrong was a really good shooting point guard, Tony Kukoc was a great six man, Ron Harper, Steve Kerr, Luke Longley, Rip Hamilton was a 20 point per game scorer in MJ's first year with the Wizards, and Larry Hughes averaged 13, 5, and 3 on the Wiz. But with MJ, the multiplier gets complicated because to most people, the Wizards years really don't count all that much, and not giving him the multiplier would seem cheap, so we will do the multiplier for his 13th season with the Bulls, but not multiply the two Wizards guys. That's a total of 41 help points for MJ. For Kobe, he had a superstar in Shaq. Pau Gasol will more than likely become a Hall of Famer. He has the overseas resume to match an already solid NBA resume. Eddie Jones was an all star as well as Nick Van Nexel and even though he was disappointing in LA, Dwight Howard was an all star. Eldon Campbell was a 14-9 and 2 block power forward, Robert Ory was a 7 and 7 stretch 4, Glenn Rice was a 16 point per game scorer, Rick Fox was a 3 and D wing, Derek Fisher, Samaki Walker was a 7, 7 and 1 power forward, Gary Payton was out of his prime but still really good, a way out of prime Carl Malone, Horace Grant, Karan Butler, Lamar Odom, Chucky Atkins, Chris Mim, Andrew Bynum, Trevor Ariza was a good 3 and D wing, Metal World Peace was an even better 3 and D wing, Steve Nash for 60 games, and in Kobe's last year, Jordan Clarkson, D'Angelo Russell, and Julius Randle were all solid players. That is a total of 66 points. For Tim Duncan, obviously David Robinson was a Hall of Famer, and Manu Ginobili as well as Tony Parker will be Hall of Famers. Kawhi Leonard and LaMarcus Aldridge were both all-stars towards the end of Duncan's career, but Kawhi will more than likely end up in the Hall of Fame, so we will label him as a Hall of Famer, but LaMarcus Aldridge may miss out on it, and he wasn't at his Hall Hall of Fame level on the Spurs with Duncan where his real prime was on the Blazers, so he will just get the all-star label. Avery Johnson was a really solid point guard, bringing in 12 points and 7 assists a game over 7 seasons with the Spurs. Vinny Del Negro, Derek Anderson, Bruce Bowen, Brent Barry was a great shooter, Michael Finley, Roger Mason, George Hill, Richard Jefferson, Dewan Blair, Gary Neal, Patty Mills, Danny Green, Tiago Splitter, Marco Bellinelli, and Boris Diaw. 50 8.5 help points. And finally, LeBron James. For Hall of Famers, Dwayne Wade, Chris Bosh, and Kyrie Irving will all be Hall of Famers. For All-Stars, we have Zadrunas Ilgauskas, Mo Williams, and Kevin Love. And for good players, Carlos Boozer, Ricky Davis, Jeff McGinnis, Drew Gooden, Larry Hughes, Ronald Murray, Daniel Gibson, Delonte West, Anderson Verajao, a very out-of-prime Shaq, Anton Jameson, Udonis Haslam, Mario Chalmers, Ray Allen, Shane Battier, J.R. Smith, Timothy Mozgov, Tristan Thompson, Kyle Korver, Jordan Clarkson, Kyle Kuzma, Brandon Ingram, Lonzo Ball, Rajon Rondo, and Javel McGee. That would be a total of 49 help points. So four help points, Russell would come in first with 75, then we have Kareem and Kobe, then Wilt, Duncan, LeBron, Magic, and finally MJ. So we will finally end with every player's resume, which will be the three biggest standout things from each player's career in comparison to each other other. With Bill Russell, being an 11-time champion is number one on his resume, being second in rebounding and blocks is second, and third is him having five MVP awards. For Wilt, being first in blocks and rebounds, having four MVPs, and having the highest prime averages are the things at the top of his resume. With Kareem, six championships, six MVPs, and being what will be second all-time in points. Magic has five rings, he would have been first all-time in assists, and he has three MVP awards. Bird has three rings, three MVPs, and he's fifth in prime and regular points per game. Jordan has six rings, five MVPs, and he was second in prime points per game and tied for first in career points per game. Kobe has five championships, tied for third in prime points per game, and he is fourth all-time in scoring. Duncan has five rings, two MVPs, and he is top 10 in both rebounds and blocks. And for LeBron's resume, he will be first all-time in points. He has three championships and four MVPs. With all of this in consideration, with every achievement, every moment, every number and championship listed out in front of you, with all of its context, with everything out on the table, 
Who is the GOAT? Well, I don't know. There is no clear answer, no clear definition. To some, winning is all that matters. If that's the case, then Bill Russell might be your GOAT. To others, championships are a team accomplishment. To others, basketball is a team sport, so championships are a team accomplishment, and they don't matter that much for a player's legacy. If that's your opinion, then LeBron James or Wilt Chamberlain might be your GOAT. Maybe you look for a healthy mix of both, then your GOAT would probably be MJ or Kareem. Maybe you love a team player. In that case, your GOAT would be Magic Johnson or Tim Duncan. Maybe it's all about the moments for you. Then your GOAT could be Kobe Bryant or Larry Bird. There is no formula for determining who is the greatest of all time. It's subjective. So, to end this documentary, I haven't used the word I for the entirety of this two and a half hour long video. But to end this video, I would just like to say, appreciate greatness. You can think that MJ is the GOAT without disrespecting LeBron James, and vice versa. Every player that I put in this video is a legend and should be treated as such. Regardless of who you pull for, choosing to hate the opposition is an ugly habit that we as humans need to stop doing. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. To show that you've made it this far, please comment Appreciate Greatness down below. And also, if you aren't subscribed already and you've made it this far, I think I've earned your subscription at this point, and I will end this video the way I end every other video. Please be sure to like and subscribe for more NBA content like this, and cue the outro music.